Uh, okay, so that's the um, uh, the like like the plan. And then for each of the strategies, uh, what it does and how it helps reading. So we need to be aware of those, and the students also need to be aware of how each one of these, each one of the strategies, can help the kids uh, comprehend better. Now it's critical that as teachers we know what each one looks like. Because one or two people said in one of the earlier discussions, but we've been doing all these things, some of you might remember, you know, we, we've been doing all these things for ages. But the bottom line is that in that particular school, the kids are not doing it. So you can do it all you like. But if the children are not doing it, we're not going to be getting anywhere. And the bottom line, remember, I'm not pushing an explicit approach to teaching. It's an explicit approach to learning. It's critical that the kids can do this and that we need to know what each of these looks like. So uh, when, when I um, uh, was working at, um, at Malakuta Primary School on Monday, and I said to the group of kids before they started to read the text, what are you going to do as you read this text? And one of the kids said, oh, I'll use my meaning-making motor. I said, that's great, mate. What will you get when you've done that? Or I'll make a picture as I read the sentence. What will you know once you've done that? Do you know what I mean? I'll get my knowledge ready. OK, once you've got your knowledge ready, what will you have? The same thing at Marlow, Marlow Primary School yesterday. So it's not enough for the kids to say at the beginning of a lesson, you know, I'll get my knowledge ready. They can bark that out and get me off their back. But I want them also to be able to say what it's going to give them. What will they know once they've done it? Does this make sense? And, and what I'm suggesting to the teachers at, you know, in that whole network, in the Bensdale network, the Paris network, and also I'll be really pushing in all of our schools here, is that once a, like once a month, once every six weeks or whatever, whatever the class, we hold up a text and we say to the kids, what will you do as you read this text? And the children on a piece of paper just write down the action they're going to use. They put their name on it, the date on it, and we collect them up. Now, if this is working, we should be able to see, for a particular group of kids, the actions changing. If the kids can't say what they're going to do, they're not even on base one yet. And so that's a, a very clear procedure that, that I can use in my teaching to actually monitor this, to see, to see which strategies they're using. And then, you know, as Effie said, we, we can take diagnostic action or we can take follow-up action. This is a way of assessment for learning, it's assessment for teaching. That's where do we teach next? What actions are the children using effectively? Or even individual kids? And what ones do we need to teach next? Okay, uh, the, third thing, the third thing we're looking at is making sure we can uh, scaffold it. Uh, we want to teach it to independence. And I'm also looking at teaching activities to get uh, each of those. So first of all, reading aloud. Um, reading, reading aloud uh, is uh, something that we, we may not often do in secondary education. Although when, when, we, when I first uh, started to work at, at Judy's school, that's what we started, wasn't it, Judy? We, we had the kids reading aloud and was probably one of the activities that the kids in, uh, probably enjoyed most. Judy? Did they? <laughs> well, well, it actually endured, because I remember the first time I was doing a lesson at uh, Judy's school, and this was in the mid-90s. Um, it was with that, that particular class, that year eight class. You probably there have been a lot of year eight classes for you since, but there was one for me there. Um, and I asked, I explained to the students that I was going to ask them to uh, read aloud and what we were all on about. And I think there were three or four teachers what, watching me do it, and the door was behind me. And uh, I asked the group, I asked someone in the group to start to read. And the person said no. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you have that moment when you stop and think, well, the door is behind you. My desk at the uni is really comfortable. Um, but we didn't. We continued. Um, and uh, I... I then just asked, put my head down and didn't dare maintain eye contact with anyone and said, well, would someone like to start to read? And thank God someone, well, thank God someone did. 
And, uh, at, and the, the third kid who read was, was the kid who said no initially. There was that dread, there was that year eight class. You, you probably don't remember. <laughs> I won't say what sort of a community, but anyway, they, no, they, they, I'm sure they are, Judy. But, yeah, yeah. but uh, it, it, it made a point for me uh, that we re when we're talking about reading aloud, we, we really need to make it clear to the students what it is that we're on about. And I wouldn't have given to that group of students any of the spiel that uh, we're going to go through now because I just hadn't thought of it you know, at that time. And, and one key aspect of reading aloud is that when I read aloud, I'm actually taking the words here and I'm moving them into my head. It's like the first step in getting the words from here to here. So it's like me making a conversation with, uh, you know, with myself. It's like me moving the words from here uh, up to here. And I think the students need to be aware of that. And what it also does is that it allows me to link what is a, a separate set of ideas in a text. It allows me to link them into well, what we would call sentences or link them into units so I can think more about them. And I think students need to be aware that the reading aloud is the means by which we get the text into our heads. We can't do anything with it until it is in our heads. Yeah, it needs to be read aloud correctly. And on most of the occasions when I'd have the students reading aloud, I, I would have then, because in that particular class, all I wanted was one child to read one sentence. And then I probably would have read the sentence after them. And then we would have been engaged in the other things. What's another way of saying it? You know, what pictures ask you to make in your mind? And so the children very quickly see that it's not reading aloud as an end in itself. Reading aloud is a means to doing other things with the ideas. And it needs to be in very small bursts. It needs to be in sentences initially. But also, I wouldn't be starting off uh, the way I did start off in, in, uh, in, in Judy's school uh, when, when we did start off like that. So uh, th that's what it does. We do, need, we do need fluency in the reading aloud. And so we need to think in a secondary classroom of how we're going to try to get fluency, and we are talking about fluency for individual sentences, we need to look at the difference between reading aloud and uh, reading silently, because some people will say, well, look, why don't you just have the kids read silently? But the articulating process, uh, it, it's called a uh, subvocal articulatory process, it's actually set up, uh, is much more effective than the silent reading process. And you know, if any of you go home tonight and there's a letter from the solicitor in the tax department, you'll probably read it aloud. Now, if you've received 20 letters from the solicitor in the tax department, you probably won't read the 21st aloud. <laughs> you'll be shaking, but um, no, no, you, you, you won't need to. But probably the first few, you will. And there's a reason, we need to talk about a reason for that a bit later. But uh, reading aloud really allows you to manage how you take the information in. It, it really allows you to control how you're thinking at the lowest levels about what's in the text. 